Are we set? Testing, testing. Think Eventually we need to actually have like an opener. We also need to remember to introduce ourselves this time. Oh yeah. We just what? kind of assume. How about now? <laughs> now sounds like a great time. <laughs> Hi um, guys, welcome. This is uh, <laughs> this is Maxwell Martinez. And this is Chris London. And welcome to the next episode of Rough Draft, our podcast on the creative process. Uh, we have two guests joining us today. Uh, would you mind introducing yourselves? I think they. Would. I guess they do. Uh, so, we have we have with us uh, Owl and Bird. Uh, that is their uh, performing duo. It's made up of uh, Allison or Al Schneider, uh, depending on whether you grew up with her or not, and uh, <laughs> Wendy McComb. That's uh, correct. You got that, that is correct. Right. That was yeah. Wendy. We got one. They talked. That's I, it. Well, when someone gets something right, I I do speak up. <laughs> I only speak and if somebody says something correct. When something wrong. wrong, I quietly internalize it yes. and say nothing. <laughs> Good luck. I love being held to such standards. I uh, yeah. I think this is actually a really interesting setup for <laughs> the episode today, just because uh, Allison and I kind of grew up together. Sort of. We were near the end of growing up, but like in high school. <laughs> I'm we, still growing up. Right? That's that's a, that's a fair <laughs> point. Uh, that is a fair point. Uh, uh, Allison and I went to school together uh back home and uh then we went our separate ways and i found max and she found wendy and now we're bringing them here and uh they they don't know anything about each other so they don't. i was told i was trying to ask questions earlier and then i was told to uh to save it go into this blind yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. because i mean the audience has to learn about him anyways how, how do you describe the kind of performance that you do like what, what would you say you guys are well i just read today on a post that she describes it differently than me. Really? Oh, well, really? let's get both sides. Oh, yeah. She uses all these really big words. <laughs> and, you know, it's very interesting. What's the biggest word that she uses? Quintonian. I don't know what that means. Quintonian? Go ahead and say it correctly. <laughs> Quotidian? Quotidian. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't... Oh. That is a pretty big word. <laughs> it's French for of the day, I think. Is it? What does that have to do with... <laughs> That's... <laughs> I think that means of the day. Oh, right. No, 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 no it's, it's like, it means like like every day, like yeah. There's as a in like oh, like well, that's very every day. everyday terms. There's a thing called le pain quotidien, uh, that is just literally like bread of the day. Hmm. I think is what it translates to roughly, or I think it's something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is just in <laughs> Manhattan. Oh, and I love bread, and yeah. that's what we do. I hope we love bread. I think everybody. That's, that's what their bread. show is. I <laughs> know. Uh, say but, your full thing that you wrote today, uh, and, I'll, and then I'll say mine. <laughs> just to remember, I've written that before. That's been on other things. As well. <laughs> what uh, exactly? How would you describe I, your performance? So I guess what I what I mean by I I describe it as absurd and quotidian at the same time, um, but. Um, I just say non sequitur French New Wave play with some Steve Martin and vaudeville. Yeah, which I, I say a bit of that too. I, and I she also adds that. a lot. Unnecessary suitcases. academic mumble. No, you say a jumble. suitcase full of flowers. They're laughing flowers. Laughing flowers. <laughs> we perform on uh, rusty stages. I read you wrote that today. Mm -hmm. Garden parties. Poetry night. Did we answer the original question? I think I, I think, think so. so. Uh, <laughs> we, we described. It. I'm trying to figure it out my myself, but maybe, I don't. Maybe I should have shown you a clip. Yeah, maybe that's no, it. No, no, we'll keep describing it visually. Yeah. Or actually, can you just perform for us and we'll actually, describe it to the audience yeah, for you? Yeah, it is actually something that you could just do, I guess. Oh, I wasn't being serious, but that's if that's genuinely. We can do it if you we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you? Uh, yeah. Just sitting down. Hey. Okay, yeah, I guess I guess it wouldn't be very physical just, just because right, of the nature so of what we're doing. My right question now. is: is it is it pre-written? Is yes. it okay? Yes, yeah. Okay. It's yeah. pre-written and it's like non sequitur. Okay. Writing and mm -hmm. using the regular like human language. Our devising process is: I mean, like we we do write the scripts, mm -hmm. but the where the where what the scripts are comes from is from, I think, kind of a collaborative devising practice that we're constantly in when we're together, mm -hmm. um, whether we mean to be or not. And so we, we take the things that we say to each other or phrases that we, we think are uh, maybe overused to the point that they don't mean anything anymore 
or maybe phrases that aren't said enough. Um, and, and then put the true meaning to it with a visual yeah. uh, like aspect. And sometimes it's heart-wrenching, and sometimes it's, like, uh, funny. Yeah. And we try to, if it gets really heart-wrenching, we try to, like, end it with a joke and then move on to the next heart-wrenching thing. Um, yeah. I don't know, just so, to I remind mean, people. Yeah, so we'll say anything <laughs> from, like... Uh, oh, let me help you with that, or like, uh, you know, how are you? Like, just little things like that. Or so, saying over and over again, what do you want? What do you want? Yeah. What do you want? Yeah. Or no, thank what do you. you. Want? What do you want? Um, I'm really But then we'll him. also say things like, uh, oh, did you want to know what I he want? I want to know. know what he wants. I what, want to know. What he wants. What he wants. Oh, it's me specifically. Could you tell I'm us? I'm making direct eye contact with you. You cannot deny it. Oh my god, you were, but she wasn't, and I didn't know if this was a skit. I would like to fully understand, I mean, but I think... You're a performing partner, it's not a high You'd like mind. to fully understand? <laughs> yes, I'd like to you fully think understand. he understands? Does he understand? No. I understand. I think that's... A, and I would like to know how you two <laughs> found a way to understand each other on such a, I would say, visceral level. Um, god. God well, helped you understand no. <laughs> on such a... <laughs> Well, we met in a garden in a backyard, and then we were together on Mardi Gras, and we were sitting by a tree, and we stared into each other's eyes, and um, and then we... I, uh, that I, was it. That was it. I think yeah. we both just wanted to perform, like, separately before we knew each other. I know I've, I came from a performance background, and I've been wanting to have a performance partner for years. Years. Okay, just... And right. of course I meet her in the backyard and she's like, oh, I'm a performance artist, which I don't have that background. Um, and I was like, oh, that's cool. And somehow we're like, hey, let's Google Docs. And then she's like, okay. And then um, I fancied Elaine May and Mike Nichols' work, mm -hmm. uh, their telephone conversations from the 50s. And uh, next time I came back to New Orleans, uh, we just, I, she bought a telephone. I brought my telephone from home and then we started with a character called Gail. And then uh, she had written a script, this non sequitur format we're talking about, for a friend of hers. And I read it and I was like, oh my God, this is beautiful. And uh, our friend luckily didn't want to do it live. And I well, kind of gently suggested, if you ever wrote one for me, uh, perhaps we could. And uh, she did. And then we did it that day. Yeah. After we bought uh, yeah. 1980s power suits at the thrift store for the act. Yeah. And uh, the rest was history. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was a similar thing of I've, I want, I've been wanting people to perform with or have a performance partner to, to devise things with. And then Wendy just showed up and, and she's just really ready to, to go for it and had all these ideas that were uh, on kind of a similar wavelength to me of like wanting to to be really silly and and play but then also just really like really get straight to to like being insecure and, and vulnerable I think a lot of our work is about being vulnerable obscure emotions and yeah. putting all vulnerability out on the table because I personally just believe in general not even on the stage that you should be very open with your emotions. It's just most humans aren't, I guess. I, that took me a while to figure that out. And uh, <laughs> I guess uh, this act is a way to, you know, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but it also opens up a lot, I think, for people to have discussions afterwards or maybe plant a seed that people can feel like maybe mm -hmm. they can just say what they want. I do believe, like, that's how we were able to come together is because... We both wanted something, and 100% when you just want something, it's always usually okay, I think. Maybe, perhaps, I don't know. <laughs> like, that, 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 that could open a huge hey, can wait, of worms. I, 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 I would hey, not say 100%, sure. however. Sure 100%. This, is, this, is, this, is, this is the wrong hey, political listen, climate to be saying shit like that. I don't want to take responsibility. I will really say sure. I'm that, was a, that was a beautiful <laughs> sentiment. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure. I don't know, but never mind. I back out. No, no, I think it's... That's what we're trying to get you to do. I don't want to. I'm not sure. I think I... It's... No, all... That's okay. Uh, oh. No, all jokes about that aside, I do think that it's... I think that if we were honest from the start with the things that we want, I think that then it would stop us from wanting things that aren't as good, I guess. Well, I, that's I feel... self-deprecating sounding. Is it? 
I think so. I didn't fully compute it, but um, I, think, I would like, not right, put it past you know, like, for, the, the, to be the whole, the whole overreaction we just had about like the whole, like, oh, just because you want it doesn't mean you should, you know, that whole thing. Um, obviously, talking uh, about like people want what? bad things. Yeah, I was like, I, w- I could give you several <laughs> instances but, but where I think wanting that a lot something of times, is not like, what? justify. <clears throat> um, but if you like this it. This goes a little bit too uh, in-depth and also, I, I don't oh, know. Oh, it's too vulnerable? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, ch- child pornography, bestiality, uh-huh. things that like people, they're, these are things that people want that don't necessarily, uh, uh, that aren't necessarily indicative of getting them just because you want them or it doesn't justify. Also, like, if you don't, it, a lot of people want things from other people without consent. That's not necessarily. Yeah, but, just, <laughs> but if you say what you want and you're very clear of it, everyone oh. knows who you are and what you want and they can just oh, decide for I guess, themselves what I guess, they I guess want there, I guess too. there is a difference between saying what you want and then forcibly taking it. Well, I definitely wasn't implying forcibly. No, 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 no. But you were. But what I understood, what I heard from it was that um, if people, if, if people saying what they want or doing what they want, one hundred percent of the time is all that it, is all that is required to be okay. Um, and I would say saying, yeah, absolutely, Ed, everybody should say and do, or I would say everybody should understand inherently what they want, analyze what they want, but I don't know if necessarily doing exactly what you want at all times uh, oh, is... That's too bad. Pro- no, I mean, push the limits. Find as... Go as far as you want and make sure that you... I mean, that sounds very hedonistic, and I think that's very impressive, but... I was dreaming here. Oh. <laughs> um, are, are you dreaming? I'm not dreaming. Are you dreaming? Are you dreaming? Is this a dream? Who's dreaming? Who the fuck I think, here I don't know. is dreaming? <laughs> Who's dreaming here? Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Hey, pal. Hey, pal. Hey, pal. Hey, pal. Who are you? I'm Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me that. You gave me that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, um, you gave, I think that one of you. Thank you, thank you. Thank Did you, you. see that face? Is there like, what the fuck? <laughs> That's a little uh, uh, bit of the show. I, I, I witnessed, I experienced. I think. <laughs> their no, faces. I, I, I think that, by the way, their faces, they didn't, they were just so tense and like they couldn't breathe for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no, I think, I think though, like, you know, the idea, because I, I think I, when people want things that are more harmful i think a lot of that comes out of mm. comes mm. out of repression mm. I, I guess i think it's interesting that yeah i immediately you yeah i mean i, I totally agree. agree with like you 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 know you can't always get you make, what make jagged want, make jagged tall i stuff. um yeah but um i love the stones um <laughs> i love, I love the stones yeah love like, them. Man. oh man but what were you saying before uh, you what made a weird saying. joke um I, it's interesting that you've immediately equated the word want with yes. hedonism. It's like yes. you've, or like you've immediately equated the word want. It was like specifically pleasures that okay. I feel like that's where the conversation immediately went. Like mm-hmm. even yes. if, even if you like had other thoughts in your mind as well that you associate with that, the conversation immediately got directed to like people doing things that they want because they're indulgent. Well, and they the want term, bad the, 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 bad. This... and and rather I think what. The and trigger then, for that was the 100%. You can say want all you want and that's fine, but when you say 100% of the time wanting and doing what you want, that's that was the triggering point, I think. But that's so interesting to us that that mm-hmm. makes it a trigger and okay. it seems um yeah, it's just I think that's such a planted thought of society, but you know, to each their own, and this is no no fight that we are having no, for you. But all. we, I do think it's an interesting, <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting point of view. That's like, oh way. ah, versus like, oh, that's cool. I can be a hundred percent me. I can say exactly what I want, and my needs and wants will be met. And maybe not by the person directly in front of me, and maybe not in this moment. But I'll that will lead me to finding the place and people I need to be around because I'm being completely 100% authentic. I'm mm-hmm. being completely. And hey, let's say I do like child pornography. Well, all the people don't will get the fuck away from me, and maybe I'll find a cool group. I mean, that sounds sick, right? But it's true. I think we do have like a there's like a societal pressure that tells you like not 
to be selfish, and I think that that is yeah. where a lot of it comes from. And I think that when you look at most of our problems and most of the time uh, that somebody is doing something they shouldn't be, uh, a lot of times you can usually trace that back to some kind of repression or some kind of... I agree of... fully. And, and not so... saying or knowing what you want. Yeah. And I think there's like multiple interpretations of want, I guess. Like, cause yes. Because there, cause there, cause there's, there's like the immediate like physical things, but like, like, oh, I want to... You can say like, oh, I want to eat this, but it's like, but that is coming from a different want that is, you know, yeah. I want to do it's something it's about my hunger. It's usually an onion. An onion so, effect, like, yeah, you want, but then it's like, oh, yeah, why do I want this? Oh, because I'm lonely. Yeah, so I Oh, why do I really need a hug? So I guess, like, in terms of, like, just, at least when it comes to, like, being honest about, you know, like, from, from like, a, a core, like, what you need as a person sort of thing. Yes. Like, like, core motivations as opposed to, like, specific physical things. I think, yeah, being able to be honest about what you want out of your life. Or what you need to survive. Like, yeah. I personally need people who are direct with me, and it would be kind of a joke if I was like, oh, I don't need that. Does that make sense? I can barely hear you. <clears throat> oh, um... I should probably take these headphones off. Why do I have these on? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not listening back to anything, and it's just no, making it more difficult to have the conversation. I don't know, but I I, I, I get where you're going with it. Because, I don't know, I mean, there, there's no denying that there are times where people want things that are kind of sick and i guess i wonder if if we early, go if, towards if, if, speciality if, if, if early no no no, no. i, I wonder i wonder if suggesting. earlier on in their life mm -hmm. they had been less repressed about their their desires and their needs if their current wants if they would have like developed and grown in like a healthier way yeah I if guess. somebody didn't repress their like as a child to be hugged or a child to be heard some if that wasn't repressed at like age six or ten then yeah, that probably because like you look at would these, have not happened. Especially because like you look at like s these studies and everything about people who are homophobic generally having like yeah a, a history of having been repressed. Yeah, of course. And fashion. if we go towards your thought initially, it's like yeah, people who are homophobic are gonna want to hurt people <clears> who <throat> are you know gay or whatever. And it's like yeah, that's not their real want. They they. they Two or three layers down, it traces back to what they really want. It traces back to something else they didn't get yeah. fed, and then it eventually, yeah. over not taking care of that, warped into something that's that kind was, of fucked up. Yeah, and that doesn't ever, it's never going to uh, complete their, themselves. It's never yeah. going to help them. So back to performance art. Yeah. Well, I was... Well, I, was <laughs> I, think, I guess the thing that I really wanted I, to drive to eventually was just like, you know, why do you do the, the kind mm -hmm. of performance that you do? Um, that's part of it. Yeah, and, and that's that's why that's why I wanted to have the conversation. Go. So yes, what I was saying it. before about yes. the thing about it's interesting to see uh, that that was your response to us using the word want there mm -hmm. is that I think that's part of what we Which were I saying completely that agree. we do is that we yes. will use phrases like what do you want or I want this but we'll put them in a different context where maybe you can start to think about that question differently so yeah. I don't know if it's I don't, maybe it's weird to try and describe a bit that we do I don't, well we did I, yeah I mean <laughs> you just did a bit I but, assumed this entire <laughs> I, I assumed this entire sequence was no. essentially a kind of a byproduct of of mm -hmm. uh, what your performances uh -huh. are usually I could be wrong but yeah. um, um so sorry so the bit is that um well where, that's another bit that we don't be sorry of and there's another bit where we don't let Al speak. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. so sorry. Uh, so, so the the like what we did on Friday anywhere what, anyway when Wendy said what do you want, which that was a different circumstance because of an audience member we had at that performance. But there was you know there's kind of this bit where there's these we're being really like soft with each other for a moment and saying hey pal hey pal and we're kind of like giving each other these hugs and then. Bird says, uh, hey, pal, you want to go to dinner with me? And I get, like, really viscerally angered by that. And I say, like, I don't, I don't need to go to dinner with my pal. I'm fine. I don't need you. I don't need you. And then the response to that is Bird just goes up to the mic and says, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And I feel like by putting it in that context, you kind of, it's like, well, it's, it's that thing it's you were saying of like, what do you, it's that onion you were talking about. It's like, what do you really want? Oh, I want a hug or I'm lonely or whatever. And so we, by, by sort of using that phrase, what do you want, instead of it being like, what do you want? Like how we might hear that phrase or like, yeah. or if somebody asks you, what do you want? You might go like, 
oh, it's fine. I don't, I don't want anything. Don't I'm it. okay, you know. But if it's like, you know, you kind of contrast those things but and put that, it in that. That <clears throat> really needs is, yeah, what do you really want? Why is this happening right yeah, now? Yeah, why are you doing this? What is it that you want that is that you're not getting that's making you respond in this way here? And, mm-hmm. and why can't you just say it? You should just be able to say it. Like, please just tell me what it is you want. Because and most people won't. Yeah. When it can just honestly cut so much yeah. fat out of, like, a relationship and yeah. go right to the understanding. Mm-hmm. But I think that's kind of an example of, of how we're trying to use language in, in our pieces and mm-hmm. some of those, like, more intense moments especially. Or works like, let me help you, let me help you, let me help you while I'm tying her up with rope. Let me help you. And she's saying, thank you. Okay. Thank you. This let me help good. you. Okay. Let me help you. Yeah. Let me help you. This feels good. Thank you. Thank you. Now hug me. I can't. Just hug me. I'm trying. I'm trying. It's not enough. I'm sorry. It's not enough. I'm sorry. It's not enough. I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed as hell. I think I understand a little bit more of what y'all do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So there's Um, stuff like that that's like, you know, and then there's other bits like Tony, you know, like, you know, the silly stuff. Who are you? Tony. I'm Mm -hmm. Tony. Hey, I'm Tony. You know, but that's like still... I think that's still serious for us in a certain way. Well, I'm, I um, want to understand how Tony's serious yeah. for us. <laughs> Go ahead and explain <laughs> that one to me. Uh, I think some of the caricatures we do, some of the like over over the top things, are still pointing at at you know some yeah. kind of behavior that is uh, that is in excess because it's not um, because that person isn't getting what mm-hmm. they what they really want or, or yeah, they're I not. I thought you always just wanted to do Tony so you could trip on stage. <laughs> she trips at the I, end of it. That's part of it. So I really she like do a fall prat, on a stage. A double Pratt fall. She loves it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it uh, sounds like y'all play, or I mean, it can tell that y'all play really, really well off of each other. It's scary <laughs> impressive. <laughs> no, I guess. The, um, but I was, I don't know. Um, can I ask what? What would you say, if you have one, is your trajectory with this specific uh, team? Like, with your performances, like you just... where are we going? Where are you going? <laughs> where are we going? Oh. Um, what is your idea of success in terms of where you're taking this? Um, oh, I'm just happy we're in New York. And that's... that's yeah, I'm that's just happy a... we're doing shows. I mean... I, th- I think both of us really like that, like, whenever we do a show, it's always a totally different audience that we have, and it's, I mean... And one we of write the... a new show for every night. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and so it's it's hearing what the audience has to say about it, and I think, for me, it's kind of a research project of, like, figuring out how, or just learning about how different audience members react to, to the different things we do. Um, mm-hmm. and so it's a successful show for me if somebody got something. If I, I hear guess. one person in the audience go, oh, <laughs> then I'm like golden. I yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like pretty good. No, that's awesome. I mean, that, that in and of itself is a trajectory, the kind of the here and the now and the, it, it yeah. kind of allows it to be sort of a never ending, never ending process, which I think is really cool that I've never never fully understood something like that. <laughs> oh, why not? No, I, I don't know. Uh, it's just not ever, it's not a perspective that I've looked on. I, I've looked at any, any performances, anything that I've done, anything that I've written is very much like I do this, I write this or I perform this. And then after X amount of time, it's done and we do something else and I move on and I find a different path mm-hmm. or a different, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I think we know that that will happen because when we created Gale, Mm-hmm. We did Gale. We killed that Gale for like three or four shows. And then we filmed Gale, and then we're like, "Okay, we're done with Gale. We we want something else." Mm-hmm. And then we did our first Alan Bird, and now we just are addicted to it in a way. But Gale co- came back like at our last house show mm-hmm. um, in Plattsburgh the other night, and she just she came. She came. Oh. <laughs> Twice. She yeah. had, sounds like yeah. she had a good time. She did phone burlesque for two and a half minutes mm-hmm. with no talking. That was yeah. cool. And then uh, she was out of breath for a while. And then mm-hmm. uh, they 
they and talked, they talked and, came. and and then they came yeah and, and then the, we gave the audience a intermission while we uh, got ready for the third act of Allen Bird I think that we both know that we will know when it's time to move on we don't yeah. I don't think we need to put a limit or discuss <laughs> and you know yeah like, so do you yeah. so do you think it's a thing where like you felt like Gail stopped growing basically like you'd gotten what you're going to get out of it and so i think gail yeah. you know, other yeah things? and gail kind of ended up yeah. growing in a weird way yeah gail, when we you went can to say shoot, it yeah like when we went to <laughs> we'll yeah. tell gail gail used to be as she's like a sexually repressed they're both sexually repressed women who are codependent so mm-hmm. therefore they have like a really kind of shitty other in, in shit person. relationship. They only talk on the phone. Only on the and phone. And they're really mean to each other and they project things onto each but other. But that is how they receive love because they're codependents and they're repressed yeah. women. And then it was like, I don't know, we just we had spent started, time together. We started as to people. care about each other more, and so then we tried to film Gail, and we were just <laughs> too nice to each other. As we, Gail, we like just we cared. Just, yeah, like anytime Gail had a problem, instead of being like, yes, uh. She'd be like, and What's wrong? I feel like you're a little more empathetic than me just naturally, but like so, so this way, so like I just remember like the first time I had a problem with Gail. Yeah. She was like, "Well, are you okay?" <laughs> and then I was like, "Then I was yeah. into the empathy, like, oh yeah, this is nice. Yeah, I'm okay. Like, I'm fine. Yeah. Like, and this so is what's really happening. And it then like she had a problem, yeah. and I was like." Well, can I do anything for you? And it's like, that's not a bit. <laughs> that's not a bit, yeah. But we didn't even know. So we filmed all of Gail, super empathetic and loving. And then we were like, what's happening? Why did it? We didn't know. Yeah. And then I think we figured it out in the car, and we were both a little perturbed, which is yeah. totally Gail. Yeah. And then we did our last show with Gail. Well, not our last show, but we did one more show with Gail, super drunk. And uh, we got a time limit by the guy. You got three minutes. Is that cool? And we looked at each other like, yeah. Yeah. We didn't talk. We just got on stage, killed it, <laughs> super drunk, and then we're like, what's next? <laughs> A.K.A. Alan Bird. Yeah. 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 So she had a good, like, yeah. send-off, but Gail only just came back the other night, and she was great. At the yeah, we're station. actually, this is our real voices. This is Gail's voice. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I do not have this, whatever this accent is. <laughs> I'm I... from Long Beach, California. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let everyone know. Yeah, I'm from uh, I'm from Washington State, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do we have accents right now? Oh, you've had accents. Yes. You've had the exact same accent <laughs> yeah, since I walked through the door. Yeah, this is how we talk to each other now. We just talk to each other like this. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's you've had this accent the entire time, and then we were doing the sound check, and Al was, she was talking like this, and it was very like polite, and it was very kind oh. of like. But it's like we're not there. There's Al. Yeah. Okay. We're also afraid of intimacy, so that's why we talk like this. Well, I was going to say on the okay. way, on the way back. <laughs> Does that make a little more sense? I don't believe you for two seconds. It's like a layer of No, it's true. Intimacy. I never was taught how to hug as a child. That's another reason why Alan Bird is yeah. such a cathodic, lovely experience. Yeah, I mean, me. I think that's the other thing that we... So I don't ever get a hug. I don't know I need hugs. Yeah. So until I ask for a hug, Which we I realized the other night we were having we were, <laughs> we were having a difficult time. We were, like, about to go on... In like five minutes. And I'm like, my my head is blank. And we were both I don't know what's just going like, on. Both of us were just like, ah, ah, And both of us were like, I need ah. something. And I then we realized something. afterwards that we just needed to give each other a hug. <laughs> so. Yeah, so as much as we're <laughs> together and in sync, honey, you know, with yeah. a little, yeah. the hug. Uh, that, yeah. It's like uh, we're a dad. You know, it gives you a side hug. Yeah. Because they, they <laughs> don't <laughs> understand. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, one of the bits that we came up with, I think, which was uh, in that car ride on the way back from uh, from Gale, we got we pulled up to my house and I was going inside and I was feeling like really weird about things and I said I feel a little insecure now I need to go and I just left the car and like slammed the car door shut <laughs> and then went back went into the garage and then came back and was like okay I'm fine now <laughs> but like you know just statements like that of just saying I feel insecure now I don't think is something that people say very often or. I don't understand how to be desired. Think so. That's kind of the opposite end of. There's the one end of like phrases that are used all the time, but p- people have different meanings mm-hmm. for them, or they've lost their meaning, and then we try to realign meaning to them. And the other end of it is things that just like don't get said because they're just so straightforward, and they're so so. There's that kind of ambiguous language, and then there's that straightforward, just like hard cut. Like I feel insecure. Like stop. Yeah. 
No. Stop. Yeah. I don't understand how to be desired is like a, a phrase that just sort of comes in suddenly out of nowhere, like from the midst of like a limbo act. I just say that and and it and that's yeah, I guess that's one of the things of that funny bit and then it <laughs> knocks you or it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, would you like me to keep making loud noises into Please. the microphone? If you can, yeah, if you, can, if, you can actually, if you can actually just hit the microphone. We want the audience's ears to okay. pop as much sure. as possible. Oh, God. Can, <laughs> why? I, didn't, I never liked the way it looked the minute I saw it. <laughs> That's, it's fairly uh, standard. I don't, but I don't like standard. For people who discuss um, being afraid of intimacy and uh, being insecure, mm-hmm. You come off as uh, extremely vulnerable and extremely confident and extremely, I, I guess, um, inherently strong. Thank you. And I was, and I'm just you. kind of wondering where, a, where does, where did you find that came from, or has it always been a part of your life? The strength or the yeah. vulnerability? Huh? Or the insecurity. Sorry, or the, the vulnerability. The, oh. the well, men? vulnerability. Men, men, wait. Men. Men, You're crediting men is just, your strength of men. No, she's no, crediting her I'm in, my insecurities, insecurities to my men. Vulnerabilities to emotional abuse. Okay. That's tight. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's what no, we've been talking about. I guess for I should have like asked. Three days. No, it was a no, mm. not your insecurity, but your vulnerability, which I, I, I mean, I, I equate vulnerability and, and strength I, in kind of the same. Yeah, this no, can no, get no, really, this can get I very, so. this can get very deep because you know I haven't like, we've talked about it or we do acts on it, but um, I've been super outwardly emotional my entire life, just like saying things, and then you know eventually around age twenty, twenty two, being like, wait a minute. I thought I was wrong and a bad person for doing that because it was not accepted, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I've always been outwardly emotional. But I think in time, I have, you know, adjusted and changed and realized there is an onion effect because the outwardly emotions might have been sideways emotions. You know, they might have been me thinking I knew what I wanted thinking I'm being authentic I'm being completely real right now why don't people accept that and it's kind of like yeah but but did I peel down the two layers and it, did I ever say exactly what I really needed or I was kind of thought I was being emotional or vulnerable if that makes sense my entire life but I was really just like flailing around like a fish being super emotional probably does that make sense at all like yeah yes yeah so I think in the last two or three years I've discovered that and like so I know it's not at all wrong to be emotional but when you are being emotionally emotional outward uh, outwardly to know and be like true to like exactly what you're going through or Mm -hmm. exactly what you need or want and I don't know I guess my vulnerabilities have just always been outward since a kid are you saying strength or strength? Oh no! The, I, like I said I equated the the, the two that so that same? vulnerability because for me I'm oh wow to kind of that's, that's um, very nice thank you. Uh, I, I guess for me I'm I come from South Texas. I'm I'm promise you I'm not trying to make this about me, but a quick story. Um, I come from I South ho- Texas. I hope you do make it about me. <laughs> I think um, that's nice. I come from South Texas, and everything is we're very polite, and we also like. We, we definitely hug. We hug, we say I love you, but it also comes with the context of, but like not too, like, yeah. don't hug too much. Not don't too hug, Like not too, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, and so <laughs> coming to New York City, being surrounded by uh, performers and, and, and my classmates who openly performed and openly would be like, look what I can do. I can dance. I can sing. I can do this. I was never around that. My family never, whenever I told my family I wanted to act or I wanted to sing or I want to do anything, they'd go, okay, well, that's nice and never had any interest. And anytime I did perform or anytime I did try to do anything outward, they would kind of be like, oh, Max is being embarrassing again. Max, like awesome. they'd support, they would be like loving. They're like, Lax, we love you. Do what you need to do. But there's always that little bit of like, but not too loud, not a too limit. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when I hear that there are people who grew up just playing the piano for their family or for their friends or singing or performing or doing whatever, that's always very impressive to me. And I can't, it kind of brought, came into uh, being here in the city where I would do auditions. And in the auditions, the first thing they ask you is, so how are you doing today? So like, 
how, how, how are you? What's happening? And because I was always told in auditions, you must be likable. You must be liked. My answer 100% of the time was always, I'm wonderful. Thank you so much. How are you? Uh, even when I was scared, even mm. when I was tired, even when I was nervous, I, I still don't fully know how, but I found that, uh, some of the most vulnerable and impressive auditions that I've seen are whenever you ask that question, people just stop and they'll go, you know, I'm kind of nervous, uh, but I'm here. So let's do this. And then as soon as they let that out, that allows for mm. something really cool and something really yeah. kind of vulnerable to come through and so I feel like yes vulnerability is a strength but it's also a learned trait that I don't think a lot of people know how so that's why I asked I wanted to I know see. how who taught you or where did you teach yourself to be that strong you know I grew up teaching myself everything I was not raised by anybody and that's why even as you know an adult I'm still teaching myself how to hug a person I have to like I call it, I tell Al all the time, I'm downloading that chip. You know, I, I gotta put that in the computer because. To constantly you remind know, yourself. Like, but it's like 60 days. I've only read this because I, like I said, I'm teaching myself the person I wanna be. And it all comes down to what works for you and resonance and authenticity. So if you like how people do that in the audition, you know, you're never gonna please anyone 100%, but you can please yourself 100%. No, you like being authentic in an audition, for example. Um, and I know that from learning on, you know, self-help tapes and whatnot, that it takes 60 days to download a behavior you like. And of course it's trial and error. It's like, well, the day I realized I never asked anybody how they were doing, because I wasn't taught that growing up, I, it hurt me to ask it. I had to go through that pain. It hurt. My body hurt mm -hmm. to say, how are you today? Do I know why? No. But I know I was never asked that growing up. And it took me a long time to learn how to ask people that, but now it's completely comfortable and I love it. It's like I wanted to be that person. So I, it took a lot of time and effort. And I can say just knowing Al, uh, she's taught me, you know, a lot about, you know, uh, being vulnerable and having empathy and, you know, all things that I've wanted to grow on and learn too. So if, if you want to know where I've learned even more of it, it's just recently too with her and the people you surround yourself with. Just the other day, uh, Al listened to me have an issue with my life or whatever and all she said was, I hear you, you know, I hear your pain. I have nothing to say right now about it, but I love you. It's like, oh, I guess that's all I needed. It's like mm -hmm. just an acknowledgement and how you're saying you wanted to do all the stuff. It's like, yeah, your family could have been like, oh, that's cool or whatever. But it's like to acknowledge what you wanted, acknowledge that you have your own autonomy is so important. I also think it's cool that you found out what you wanted after kind of going through a process that you didn't realize was yeah. saying what you wanted. So It was literally, and that's why I believe is, so much in the, in the act. I right. think it's so important, and, and that's not even the whole message of the act, but... Sounds like a big one regardless. So. Yeah, it's one of them. And there's so many more. So much more. The biggest is probably Tony when I figure that out. But the biggest one is Tony. That's yeah, sure. he's a star. <laughs> he is a freaking star. You Have Tony and Gail met? Oh my gosh. No, but you know. You did say I'm Tony on this podcast. <laughs> you don't have your Ray-Ban sunglasses though. <laughs> I know, they're never going to be able to hear me. Do you want to share about your insecurities, or do you yeah, guys you... want to... Do you have other questions? That's, mm -hmm. that's, a big, yeah. that's important. No, yeah, it is uh, important. Yeah, but if she doesn't want to, that's fine. I will oh, make her. <laughs> I, because... I, I, I could have I sworn, <laughs> I, I, I sworn we, we just talked about something about emotional abuse. <laughs> I will make her do it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, <laughs> I think I learned to be vulnerable part of it is through doing performance and just kind of realizing that like if you're not vulnerable it's just shit so like there's that it's true and <laughs> um she's right and yeah I mean just different people in my life I think I've I've always been a, a really quiet person um I don't know am I quiet Chris you're very quiet <laughs> when Chris knew me Chris knew me that when I was a. um 
not like this at all. Yeah, um, you, were, you were very different. Um, but, uh, um, she's even changed so much in the six months I've known her. Yeah, well, that's... Has it been only six months? Something like that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that this is no, very it's, impressive to me. It's crazy that she's yeah. no that there's a growth I from yeah. the backyard owl. Wendy And yeah. I'm not kidding. No, Bird like pushes me to, to do things in like the, the correct <laughs> she, way. <laughs> she's bleeding all over the place, being dragged. Oh my god. <laughs> no, but I uh, I would agree with what you said that like I've also just continued to learn things about being vulnerable from performing with you and and also just learn things about just like being willing to just go for something and go 100% for something no matter what just because that's what I want to do and I mean that whole speech I wrote for you about like we're here for ourselves is like it was so great to hear you say that and that's why I wrote it into the script is because I'd never heard someone talk about performance in that way what? and where it didn't sound because I feel like if somebody else said that in a different way it's like oh well you're just being selfish because it should be about the audience and the way you said it was like I don't know if I was nervous or if you were nervous or what was going on but Bird was just like uh said some s stuff about like a, you know I you, know, you just have to go up there and we just have to do this for ourselves and not do it for for them but just you know we just have to go up there and do what it is that we want to do and do it for ourselves and it was just, I don't remember what you said exactly, but it was just in this way where it wasn't, it wasn't saying we have to go this uh, because it, and do this because it's about us and we're great. But the only way that this is going to be any good or worth anybody's time, including our own time, is if we just go for it and do what, what it is that we want to be doing. Mm -hmm. And... And then I wrote that into a, a statement uh, for the act, for the act, where it's you know it's obvious it's like taken to the top and stuff. But it's, it's written a, like a stand up. It's like, like yeah. Hello, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to the show. Thank you for being here. But we'd like to let you know that we would be here even if you weren't. Even if you were not here, we would be here waiting, <laughs> not waiting, waiting, not waiting. And this potato, it is here for itself. And we are here for ourselves. And we, and we uh, are going to take this show downtown to the moon. Jerry Brown, if you don't like it, you can all fuck yourselves. A little too far, maybe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, think that's, I, th I think that's what's... I've had a very <gasps> difficult... Did you hit the cat toy? I hit the cat toy. Or right. Santa right. Claus. Maybe she'll come down and... I don't know where she is. Usually she's bothering us when we're trying to do something. Sally! Uh, so, Sally! 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 Sally. Sally. So, hold on. Chris actually found something interesting. Let's, uh... Oh! 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 Oh, <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> speaking. Um, no, like, I've, I've always had a, a rough time uh, understanding or grasping, like, abstract or absurd... Uh, in any in any genre or, or in any medium really whether it was literature whether it was uh live performance i've always like had a hard time grasping it uh but it's something i've wanted to be better at watching you guys perform it i i feel like i do understand it and i think it's i, th I think what's really nice about your act is that it is uh it does have a very clear purpose for me, I've always been very rigid and structured with the way that I put together narratives for, for things that I make. It's always been like, okay, does this thing line up with this thing? Does this theme carry through? Like, the, like does all this stuff match up thematically? And it's very surgical. I don't know. It's, it's nice to actually start getting some understanding about how you can just drop all of the concern about narrative, really, and just focus on the base emotions like what's at what's at the heart of it mm -hmm. and what motivates it and how you can drop the pretense of story mm. structure and still make your point probably more powerfully than well, i don't know it's such a i don't i don't even know if it's more or less well you like said just, you, definitely you, not more or less you said somewhere in there um something along the lines of the right structure or the right something doing something right do, as mm -hmm. opposed to wrong and i think Be, that's being concerned kind of, that like i actually get the themes like right structuring everything in the of right course way but in, as in a narrative as one of our our lovely teachers taught us um there's no such thing as right or wrong 
There's oh. uh, there's what works, what doesn't, and why. However, and that that has stuck to me to this day. Um, but I from it's a good one. My from my understanding, and this is also a relatively recent understanding that I don't fully probably understand. Um, Whoa. <laughs> hey, <yo>. um, <laughs> uh, for the the this idea of right and wrong comes from having to find a solution, having to find an answer, which is something mm -hmm. that your brain does inherently. Um, yeah. Your brain wants to find structure. It wants to find anything. So whenever it gets lost, whenever it can't find an answer, it freaks out and it goes into overdrive as opposed to realizing that the brain is actually the problem. And because the brain wants to find an answer, it completely disregards everything else that's going on in your body and everything else that's going on with you as a human. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. And I so agree with that. if you like, so if you kind of let go of this idea of I must be right, I must find this answer, I must have a solid answer. And just allow yourself to kind of be kind of in your heart or be kind of mm -hmm. in that part of your body that you're feeling. Maybe it's your feet or maybe it's your arms or maybe it's whatever. It's kind of like that in and of itself is an answer, but that's also telling you that you don't need an answer. You just need to trust that what you're doing is going to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if it feels Unt good. If it feels good until uh, it doesn't. Yeah, until yeah, it... Yeah, like the, that quote uh, from the 70s. If it feels good, do it. Uh, Right. <laughs> and uh, I'm out. Good, do it. Um, it feels good, do it. And that's well, all. Well, the 70s. <laughs> can, I, can I try to... So, oh, yes, go ahead, please. Um, I just want to say something about absurdism. I guess uh, that was a real focus, continues to be a focus of my work and, and in this and in other projects I do, but it definitely was the driving force when I first started making performance work. And then it's how I've used it has really grown thanks to what, what we do together, but sort of what I hope to achieve is to allow the audience to have a space within which they can revel in the absurdity of the everyday, because I think that everything is absurd. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Um, and the only reason that anything has meaning is because we make meaning, and everybody is playing at language in a different way. Um, a, a lot of my, my research when I was doing my master's dissertation and what I keep using my performance art is, a, is about a, comes from this philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein and his idea of the language game and the idea that we're all playing different language games and we all play different language games because we all have different rules that we've been given through our training. So we've been trained in different ways and then that means that we have different rules that we follow when we're using language and so what I kind of hope to do with the use of language is to break some of those rules and maybe sh alter the boundaries of different people's language games to the point where it's this doesn't mean something this is being used this way and it's doing something right language is an activity mm -hmm. it's not you know, referential in that way, and so it's like words are just tools, and it's really more about mm -hmm. the way that you use them that creates mm -hmm. the meaning. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's actually a metaphor that that Wittgenstein uses. He's my boyfriend. So mm -hmm. Oh God, I'm her boyfriend. Though. I think there's a. <laughs> she has a lot. Of <laughs> so many. She, has, she has a lot of boyfriends. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's afraid of intimacy. Yeah, well, they're, yeah, all, they're all dead. <laughs> That's a go dead philosopher. Um, yeah, yeah, trying to get some into this. Yes, go on. It's mainly Samuel Beckett and Ludwig Stein. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. No, yeah. good. <laughs> I was just wondering if it's very important that we got um, that out there. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense. But... I've heard enough about them. No, it does. <laughs> no, it, it does. Oh my god, she has been personally victimized <laughs> by. Because I don't have any. Dead That's boyfriend. Not, well, not oh, with that attitude. Oh, mine boyfriend. is still alive. I have to bastards. read to know if I want them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if I could just kind of uh, conclude this with a couple of questions. Uh, sure. yeah. First one is, I know that you kind of, both of you have gone in quite a bit of detail about uh, your performance style. If you had to uh, sum up your performance style in uh, one sentence each, what would it be? I said right at the beginning. You did. Can you? again. Yeah. Repetition is effective. I mean, mine's like a log line. Okay. That's okay. Repetition is effective. Is also a good description of their. Uh, well, their I, I study with Meissner, so. 
<laughs> I've, been, with, I've, been, I've been wanting wait, to say Meisner, but like, I is that not? Like, could that yeah. not be one of your dead boyfriends? Is he dead? He's dead. <laughs> oh, honey, he's dead. <laughs> Well, good. Now I can. She, has, yeah, she hasn't he's heard he's from mine. him in a while, now so she just mine. assumed. Mine? I know. Uh, I, had, I had an actor in an audition once uh, tell me that they uh, studied with Meisner, and they were like, they they, they had like they were they were like nineteen. Oh, they, he like, meant to say, yeah. Yes. No, they. Oh, they put, lied. Like, his name on the resume, yeah. and it was like, oh, I studied with him. It's like Meisner is no. a great technique to learn. Um, it is yes. What you want. I was. By the I way, was, no, it's, it? op- no, I've seen it change people's lives. I okay. Was, I was and if, the, if actors are listening, yeah, people quit See. after the second time they're there because they're just forced to be honest in the first class and they're like, yeah, yeah, See, yeah, yeah, yeah. My teacher loved me specifically because I was so closed off <laughs> and I refused to tell the truth that it would make, it would force the other person I was working with to have a natural response and it made them. Like literally, I did not do a I did not do a repetition exercise without somebody freaking out on the other end. But did you ever learn about I just, yourself? I just Probably wanted, not. I just want to point out uh, for those, for those, <laughs> that's, that's, for those of you who are familiar with the Meisner technique, the Meisner te- technique is uh, pretty rooted in like the standard exercise. Like how they always start you out is um, you're wearing a striped shirt. Okay, so okay, okay, you're wearing a striped shirt. It's, you have an attitude about that. Okay, so I have an attitude, but you're being it's, defensive. I'm not. You're deflecting. I didn't want to do this. I just he's wanted to explain repeating. to them. What so they, now he's not repeating oh and God. dealing with his own feelings, which is what Meisner is about. I'm trying to deal with the audience. <laughs> they um, get it. We just performed it. All right. So that's the. He's general deflecting. Gist. He's deflecting. He's oh, deflecting. Okay, God. so he's deflecting. <laughs> he's getting very flustered. <laughs> he is. So the point is, so Max, Max and I actually had uh, we actually we actually had Meisner class together. Um, and, uh, so you both deflected in the glass. Yeah, we both Oh, deflected. yeah. Oh, and now like, you're doing I a was, podcast. I was terrible at it until we got out of like, the repetition. Got We're learning about ourselves, all right? We're learning to not deflect via this podcast. And then you'll, yeah. I was, I was horrendous at it, except for two instances in that class where we, it, we weren't doing repetition. It was once when we were doing... Was uh, it Rabbit from Rabbit Hole was the second one. Uh, but it was also when we were doing uh, monologues from Spoon River. You made it to the final class. That's a that's a. Oh, I mean, advanced. it was that Here's was the. Here's the thing. You, you're 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 vastly overestimating the prestige of the school that we went you to. You went to like a, you did. No, most schools do a two week course or something. Oh no, we we this had was a year long thing. we had a year long Whoa, Meisner. That's crazy. Meisner one was a year long, I did and then the next year was a. I seven months in beginning for me, nine for mm-hmm. Cooper. We uh, that's yeah. just repeating for nine months, by the way. Oh, uh, we did we did we did repeating. We did we the door for, exercise. Yeah. We did Spoon River. We did scenes. We did we did we did. It was work. it was weird because like the the technique itself didn't really work for me, but I found like offshoots that did. That's great. And that, that that was like the main thing was like most of what I learned from the school was a lot of the teachers would try to give me, you know, like techniques for like how to get into like a, a scene. And like how to, how how to get there, and they never worked for me. It's but interesting I, that they had techniques when it's one technique. Meisner. We didn't study just Meisner. It's a uh, we had we had a Meisner course along with a lot of other things going on. Now it's clear. It was um, a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen Meisner change people's lives. As for performer. No, I'm not. I'm I'm not shitting on Meisner. That's the thing. No, like, I'm it, also letting the podcast I just, people. Unless he's know. into yes. it. I just think unless it's. I, I just think wants. it's the thing that I learned the most from it is that every actor has something different that's going to work for them. Yeah, um, this because, was the first technique I ever tried. Yeah, it I was. Faked it. I mean, and it you was stuck with it. I mean, it was, it was one <laughs> of my first. And you stuck with it. I did it for yeah. only two or three years, but um, I faked everything before Meisner. Hmm. I never felt anything while I acted. That's fair. And I have sincere emotional reactions now when I'm acting because of it. And I found out a lot about myself. Yeah, but there was our... <laughs> no, that's, but, 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 no, that's really... The question's about what we think about our... The end what we call What we call our... I mean, the, the... Yeah. yeah. That was just like a one sentence kind a of like French, sum up. A French new wave, non sequitur play, mm-hmm. with a little bit of vaudeville and Steve Martin suits. It's a series of phrases which have lost meaning or aren't said enough which are put into an absurd context in the hopes that they'll mean new things and the audience will... This is more than one sentence. 
I'm seeing these as I commas. liked it so much, it teared me. <laughs> and uh, that the audience will learn new things about how they interact with each other. And um, we say that we, one of the things I think I wrote is we perform, we perform all of your absurd quotidian dreams out of a suitcase full of laughing flowers on living room floors, rusty stages, and garden parties. Something like that. In the style of, and I think I say, I say a French Steve Martin dancing the six count on a vaudeville stage or something like that too. <laughs> so I, yeah, I mean, I say that too. And uh, um, I like this yeah. sentence. Yeah. This one sentence. And um, we just want to be ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the. We that's just want to be ourselves. We just want to be ourselves. We just want to be ourselves. Yeah. We just want to be ourselves. That's Merry awesome. Christmas. You're a fictional character. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the, my, <laughs> that was awesome. My second question is where and when can we see y'all? Just in, is there a general? Tomorrow, Tomorrow we'll be playing at the Living, Living Gallery, Gallery where you can draw a naked woman and drink and then watch Bird and Owl. Yes. Owl and Bird. Mm-hmm. Do y'all have a regular? Do you have like a regular place you go to? Do you have a, a web, a Facebook yeah. or an Instagram or all have, of the above? Uh, mm-hmm. It's mostly on the Owl and Bird duo, and mm-hmm. we have the Facebook. It's brand new. We made it for the tour because we're on the East Coast tour right now. We yeah. we awesome. don't really have a place we live currently. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we're doing the East Coast tour. We have a few short, more shows in New York. Mm-hmm. I don't know we'll, when this podcast airs. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully we'll be down performing at the New Orleans In Fringe Festival. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's um, a good. One. Which is November fifteenth to nineteenth. Uh, we haven't. That's not been confirmed yet, but it it's, it should be. Put it out soon. into the universe. <laughs> well, then, either way, we'll be there, even if you're not. And then the week after the In Fringe Festival, also in New Orleans, there's a Love School, a performance oh, art festival by Yeah Cypress which about our friend. And Cyprus is putting on. They're great. They're actually in the city right now too. They do Buteau, but and a lot of performance art. But um, yeah, and that's called Love School, and that's in October. That no, that's in November too. It's the week following. Yeah, so it's like the twenty fourth, twenty sixth, or something of November. So that's down there, and then we've just discussed. Oh, only Halloween is in October. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, yeah. This Halloween, <laughs> this yeah. October also is a Friday the thirteenth. Oh, oh, yeah. And this th- and, Friday the thirteenth, um, it will be Friday the thirteenth. Uh, and so we'll be there for that. And we'll be uh, somewhere, somewhere for that. Yeah, for <laughs> and, uh, Friday the thirteenth. And then we've been discussing potentially doing another tour southwest, west coast, but we don't have any dates for that yet. But that would be, and eventually Europe. And eventually Europe, yeah. So uh, we'll be performing in Glasgow on um, January eighth, <laughs> of twenty twenty. Um, yeah, but yeah, we at do Nice have... and Slazies at Nice and Slazies. It's a great place. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's on the record now. So you've got to actually get that set up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're either gonna be there or the Olympics. So <laughs> see you, see you. Either way, we're champions. And also, we do have uh, all the Instagrams and Facebooks. Yeah, Alan Bird Duo for Facebook, and I think Instagram is Owl Dot Bird Duo. Yeah, we should have been consistent. <laughs> yeah. Well, can we you might... can you not link the two even if they don't have the same name? You can maybe help us out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can you can link them. Okay. Yeah, yeah maybe so we'll get the be, technical yeah, help later. Uh, yeah. So Allen Bird duo somewhere you'll find us in yeah. a place. Near we'll you. also we'll also add a link to both and or all of these that way people can follow you. That's perfect. <laughs> You're perfect. Yeah. You're perfect. <laughs> Is that, yeah, do you have I any think... other questions? Like, um, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I <laughs> Breakfast. <laughs> Actually, I haven't eaten today. <laughs> you haven't eaten today. Haven't oh, eaten we today. made. You haven't eaten today. No, we made dinner oh, this year. You should eat it. And also, yeah. you said you weren't hungry. I wasn't. I, we asked you. I eat, I eat quite a bit. I'm. I might. My, my boyfriend likes to make me dinner, so Aww. I'm gonna like. Oh, that's really nice. You have that's, a good relationship. So nice. Thanks for rubbing oh, it in. So yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah, thanks for rubbing it in. He's, to, to be fair, he deserves it by this point. Oh, oh my god. Oh. All right, so that was Owl and Bird. Yeah, that was our first time having a guest on here. That was... I thought it was pretty cool. It was a lot. I, I, really I, cool. enjoy, I enjoyed it. 
Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, add the links to their uh, Facebook and Instagram and any other place that we can get you connected with them <laughs> on. Uh, what is it? The, what is the link below? Well, for YouTube, yeah. But for we don't, YouTube, we don't really whatever. get that option with uh, some of the other platforms. Oh, that's very well. I'm assuming Owl and Bird is going to be uh, unique enough that you'll be able to find them. True. Owl and Bird Duo for Facebook and Owl.Bird Duo for Instagram. <laughs> I don't know, I thought it was interesting just because I was hearing a lot of parallels, just like with what I want to do with my work, which is, you know, I want to talk to people about how we interact with each other and how we how we treat each other mm-hmm. and talk about the conversations that are difficult to have. Um, yeah. Just my approach is through agonized over uh, narrative structures. True. <laughs> I can see that, um, but I feel, I mean, if anything, I feel like they allowed you to uh to break out of that a bit to kind of no is this not what, getting what anything mean? i kind of break out of the need to have such an like a a, a rigid structure yeah well that's the <clears throat> that's the thing is like i mean because it's I, a lot of the way that i go about writing stories is based in my insecurities you mm-hmm. know and it, it's it's based in uh my concern about the perceptions of other people and all that jazz but i also know that i've made a lot of progress over the last couple years in letting go of those perceptions and just being more honest about what i want to do um which is why i've actually been able to finally make things i think it's so interesting i feel like you've always been pretty honest you all like you you i've always been honest uh in the sense that i wouldn't lie to people no but even in the sense of your work even in the sense of what you want and you you do have a lot of insecurities but i think it's so interesting well you i feel like well that's, what I, was, had, well, that's but... what I was talking about earlier was that was that was my breakthrough in meisner with the spoon river is i picked this piece that to me spoon river is a collection of just a bunch of uh poems essentially that are all supposed to be uh it's a the... poem anthology from the point of view of the dead yes of this like small small town called spoon river and you know like so we were supposed to have like four of them i think like all together we were assigned one we picked one and then we created one so for the one that one that we chose like you know i read through the book it was percy b shelley um and it was it was extremely uh to to me it was just they had like all this meaning loaded into it and i remember when i performed it like it was i had a hard time completing it because it was just a thing of like I wasn't trying to get emotional or anything, but like. But that's where emotion. But say, but saying those things in front of people, uh, brought a lot out of me. And I remember like afterwards, uh, our teacher, uh, Amy, she was just like, I didn't think there was anything in that piece. She was like, <laughs> she was like, I've never seen anybody do that monologue. And I thought it was a very empty monologue. I thought it was just kind of like, eh, whatever. Um, and I realized that the entire thing was because it was. It was tied into my own uh, issues, and it was tied into my own self-loathing. And so I saw, you know, like, I, I saw reflections of the stuff that was going on in my head that I couldn't find a way to talk about. About how I felt like I didn't deserve uh, the things that I had, and, like, all that stuff. Like, all that was stuff that was very difficult for me to talk about. And that piece gave me a way to talk about it. And that was, like, when I started learning, I think, about how to actually use art to communicate with people in that way uh was through that because you know up to that point like you know high school theater was always just like oh we're doing a show i'm gonna i'm gonna play this character say these lines in this scene this person's angry be angry yeah i'm gonna do i'm gonna do this character and and it's gonna make people sad because it's about a sad thing right or it's gonna make people laugh because it's a joke and how to like move past like that like like that child's like perception of it into Mm -hmm. something that's more like okay no but like what am i saying like what am i what what am i telling you what am i getting across i mean that's why that's why shakespeare still is kind of pers- uh, is <clears throat> still so persistent to this day even though the language is so intense when you when you're able to kind of take take the words which to me to this day which i thought was really cool about what they said is kind of um the words are in a sense the least important or at least um uh, the worst way to communicate because there are so many other perspectives and there's so many other ways. Once you kind of get the skill of taking a set of words 
and then actually figuring out what they mean and then conveying that to an audience in the most truthful way possible. I think that is why that's, that's, that's what's most impressive. And that's why yeah. these, these plays for all intents and purposes are, are some, as far as themes, some of the, like the easiest to grasp. It's like, I get what this theme is about, like, how do I convey that in a, in a, in a way that is compelling in a yeah, way that cause is, cause there's, cause you know, cause I, yeah, I, I, I can write something that's like, Oh, look at, look at how this is a commentary on this thing because of this. And it's like, oh, I can get all academic about it, but is it actually emotionally affecting right. you? Is and, it actually getting it across? And that's what I, that's what I really kind of, that's what resonated with me about, about what Owl and Bird were saying. Um, Al and Wendy. I don't know which one they prefer at this point, but. Um... <laughs> they, 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 they just slide between calling each other. Um, uh, yeah. But what I loved was their, their passion for kind of breaking down words and kind of allowing what's beneath words to come through um, and really challenging people's perspective uh, on words. And that's what, that's, that's, what's cool. That's what I try to do. Not that I'm successful at it, but um, in my head, as soon as I tell myself words are the worst form of communication, then that opens me up to be able to actually write anything down because as soon as i know what i'm trying to say the words that i'm using are just a tool to help me get there yeah um as opposed to focusing so much on the right words like i need this word i need these words to trying be perfect to write a monologue that sounds yeah good. like i'm not trying i'm not trying to write this like this perfect monologue with this perfect sentence structure i'm trying to write characters who are trying to communicate in the best way possible who don't always understand how to tell the truth the, the work that they do, oh, I completely forgot to mention this, like, while we were actually talking to them. Mm -hmm. uh, Wendy directed and has been editing a movie that is heading into the final stages of post-production now that is very similar to the, the work that they do. It's it's very absurd. It's very... There's a lot of repeating words. There's a lot of... And, and it's so much more... It's so it, it's It has so little to do with the words and so much more to do with the state that they're in. And it's... There's no monologue about what the character's arc is. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like there, there's no big thing where it's like, this is how I've changed over the... Like, which, in a lot of films, is like how you get it across. It's what I tend to do, is I, I have monologues about it and stuff. But, like, she has her arcs, and they never say what their arcs are. And they never really say things that are even tangentially related to the arcs a lot of the time. But you see what they're going through, and you get it. I guess. I would love to see the two of them do a production of Waiting for Godot. I think Allison really likes that play. I mean, she said one of her boyfriends is Samo Beckett. Yes. But well, that's um, the thing is like she's she's always been into that's the, yes, go on. Right. She's she's always been into that. Even when like a even even in high school, like that's what that's what she was into. Um it's fascinating to see like where she's gone since then. Can we I mean there's not a there's I'm just, I don't know, I'm trying to find I don't a, a link or something to kind of get people in contact with this movie that she's working on. I would say just follow Wendy McCollum. Yeah. Follow, yeah. W e n d y m c c o l m. Yeah. Wendy McCollum. Follow, went, follow Wendy McCollum. Yeah. Um, and uh, right. I'm, I'm assuming that whatever info is comes out about it will be available on her social media. Yes. Yeah. And then real quick, just a couple, uh, just a couple minute wrap up. Uh, do you want to go ahead and start talking about yes. kind of what we've done and what we plan on doing? Yes. Okay, uh, who wants to start? Um, I mean, I'll start because it's the easiest. It's not. I. I. I still am. I'm not gonna say I'm not as unsatisfied or as um, disappointed in myself as I was last time. Um, but I got so daunted with. I get daunted by a lot of the things that I'm trying to do. I got daunted with the idea of casting something, and I also have this idea of who specifically I want in the other role, and I do not have the credibility to get him just yet. <laughs> <laughs> um and so instead of focusing to, do, you, do you need me to call matt damon for you mm, so. you no, god no nothing like that i thought you started off like, mm, you're like well i for no. whatever reason i assumed you were gonna say like a, a, a sexy <laughs> max i don't have any context for what sexy is oh, yes, i assume that matt do. damon was sexy yes you do he's fine he's an attractive gentleman i thought um, that was like his thing no so uh and so I decided to write again and I sat down and wrote and I sat down and tried to write for like two weeks straight. Nothing was coming. And so I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to watch TV. And I got lazy and I got drunk and I got high and I watched as much TV as possible. And then I went out to this event with Jordan and <clears throat> for a bunch of his friends who were performing. 
and just watching them perform and hearing their stories it was like a it wasn't a, it was like a recital it was a recital of these people who had performed for the very first time who were performing for the very first time live in front of people and it was an audience of literally 15 people and everybody was just friends and family and these people were they ranged from like really beautiful voices to like not the best voices but there was like passion and there was love and there was just an energy and a vitality and just something came out that was just true for every single person <laughs> and it was really really intense and it was really interesting and then hanging out with them afterwards kind of got me connected with this dynamic of 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 who these people are that I'm writing and where this other gentleman comes from and I decided instead of focusing on the character I'm writing for me I decided to write an entire episode based off of the other character and his relationship and what brought him to the city and who he is and what he finds true um, in kind of a, a party setting. So I wrote a very rough draft, but a rough draft of a, uh, a pretty pivotal scene that I had the basic idea in mind, but I was able to add kind of a new layer with, bringing in a performance aspect and bringing in kind of a nervous aspect and bringing in kind of a, a, a whole new community. And as opposed to focusing on those two characters, I was able to write hopefully a successful scene about a community of people that inform one person. Uh, so that's where I'm at. I'm not sure how well it's, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm pretty confident in it. I like what I wrote, but there are a couple scenes that I don't think work perfectly but i needed to get them written just to get from point a to point b and i'm still finding out how to get how to, <laughs> how to actually make that flow a little bit better but that's where i'm at um it sucked it wasn't the best i didn't get as much done as i wanted to but i got something done and i'm pretty proud of what i got done and i think it at least sounds like you had some sort of lesson you know something that you can actually take with you which is nice <laughs> we all like, we, 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 it is it's like we it, it's one thing with, like to remember is like you know even if you're working on a project like a, like a f finite project that will be over someday the act of creating doesn't end there will be something mm -hmm. else afterwards and so like just picking things up as you go it's important you have to you have to constantly be learning or what's the point if you mm -hmm. don't if you don't learn something why bother doing more than one project because mm -hmm. you'll never see the growth because I usually don't work on too many projects. I have a couple here and there, but you work on so many projects. Do you feel like on any given day, one project kind of influences the uh, the next? Or are they usually kind of cut and dry for each project? You mean like my approach towards one thing is influenced by something that happens in another thing I'm working on? Yeah, I mean, as or is that just like, if it happens, it happens. If not, because like you work on so many things... I, for whatever reason, romantically in my head, imagine if you get stuck in one place and you focus your energy somewhere else, maybe what you learn focusing your energy there will help influence. Okay, so here's what's happened for me in the last month. Mm -hmm. um, like the day after we recorded the last podcast where I was, I was feeling kind of drained um, by that point because I had been working almost exclusively on all of these very technical very uncreative like edit jobs and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh i am now almost done with all of them like all of them will be finished this week uh but most importantly like the day after we recorded that podcast i went and started the audition process for uh, a short film i'm going to be directing next month and it was one of the most rejuvenating things i'd done in, like a long time mm -hmm. uh just working directly with actors on a piece. So I go very deep into, into, into themes and discussing like, you know, like what, like instead of like, ah, can you do the piece more like this? We really want somebody who seems like this. I don't really give those kinds of notes, at least not when I'm auditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more like, okay, so here is what drives this guy. Here is what is it's a very clear going on with him. Yeah. And, uh, so, so this piece that I'm directing is a, is a dramatic piece that initially I didn't feel that close to. And, um, 
didn't see a lot of myself in it and i didn't relate to it too much but i was like yeah, i can see how this might be good is this the one and with the kind of turbulent audition process no okay cool no cool. this one the auditions went incredibly well beautiful so with this like i start talking to like the people who are auditioning and i'm just like this is what's driving them like this is the this is the kind of stuff that they've gone through and like as i'm describing it to them just like seeing like that moment like looking at their eyes like seeing like when it clicks and when you see like something happening like in their eyes and you, you see like something like welling up like at times like you can tell like just when an actor like connects to it and then i started like as i started working with these actors like on the piece i started finding like what was actually in the script mm -hmm. and uh started going deeper and i was just like no i completely understand like where i fit into this picture and uh it became like during that audition process it became like okay i know like what i'm trying to communicate with this piece and how i think we can go about it and we wound up casting this guy we had like two options after after callbacks we were like these are both good options one was very experienced and he he hit all the notes that we wanted uh the other one was very new to the whole thing but he connected to the piece so strong and so there were times where like there were like bumpy patches like within it where I'm like, ah, we really need like something else like in this moment. But every time we got to the end of the piece, it was like heartbreaking. Mm. And it was just like this thing of like, this is where like the payoff is, 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 is just like this catharsis. And this guy, I can tell like this is hitting him like really hard, but he needs some help. Like fi finding everything else there and finding like all the, all the, all the beats and everything. Okay. And so we were we were talking about it and we were just trying to figure it out and it was just like, well, you know, like the second guy, it's like that's the that's like the that's like the riskier choice, because like I know that the first guy can come in and probably just do it and it'll be good, you know. Um, mm -hmm. He has been doing this for a long time. He's a actor with like real TV credits and everything, and he's like, he's been doing this. It's just a thing of like you know we were trying to just, we were trying to like make a choice and we're sitting there for like a half hour. I was just like, no, you know what? Like, let's let's go with the other guy. I'm like, let's let's do this one. Like, mm. this is where this is where the work is, and like, this is where the work is. It's also kind of where your heart usually lies. <laughs> you usually go for usually go for somebody who has potential over somebody who natural like who naturally has something, but you know might kind of let that get in the way. Does that make sense? Let of like. People who are so confident, like I can do this, I know how to do this. Well, this is this is what I do. Um, tend to allow their ego to keep them at that level and keep them at a plateau in a performance. And you tend to look at people who are almost there, who are not quite there, but you. I feel like you might like to challenge yourself and know that you can kind of get them there, and you feel like those are more satisfying performances. At least my experience with watching you work with others. I just feel like that's what's best for the piece. Mm -hmm. I don't think the other guy, I don't think had an ego and I think that he totally could do what I wanted. I just don't think he connected as strongly. Ah, uh, okay. And so it was a thing of like, I can go with like the guaranteed, like a minus, or I can take a risk on like potentially pushing plus. this guy for like an A plus. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm glad we brought him on because then just like the first rehearsal afterwards, just like talking to him, like it's somebody he's very into it he's super humble. It's just like this thing of like, it just feels like we're creating something again. And it's, it's well, that's so exciting. Yeah. We're going to be shooting that in like three weeks <laughs> and I'm really stoked for that. I'm, that's why I'm so excited to get all of these technical jobs like done this week mm -hmm. so that I can put those away and just be like, okay, now I'm just going to focus exclusively on these other films. Uh, Cause then, you know, the one that I'm producing is also in a couple weeks. Okay. So would you say that would be your, that's going to be your goal for, for this upcoming podcast is being able to focus as much time on this piece? Uh, no, because I, I know that that stuff's going to happen. Okay. I guess. Um, so with Sparks, Ooh. I wasn't able to get the reading done because uh, both of the main readers that wouldn't be me uh, were just not available. One yeah. of them, you know, she's just insanely busy right now. Mm -hmm. And so she's just waiting for some time to open up um, because it's important to me that I'm hearing it in their specific voices because I because need to know. For, yeah. I need to know if it works. Okay. Uh, the, but the other one uh, is just not in the city anymore, and so that's just not going to be an option anymore. So I need to. So I need to figure out what I'm going to do about that. 
Okay. Uh, although, I could just have anybody else read it, honestly. But that's the main mm. thing. So, the reading had to be pushed back. But I have been still working on it anyways. I haven't written the pilot. I need to write the pilot. But I just, I've got involved in more projects. Yep. There's a short Sounds that there's right. a short that I auditioned for that I'm really excited about, and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be getting a callback, and I think if I get a callback, I'll land it. Okay. Um, I'm very confident about this specific piece. That's the main thing is I feel like I'm getting back into like being excited about creating things again. Yeah. When before it was like the stresses of it being a job yes. had uh-huh. sunk in, and it's just but now I'm getting back into like the creative aspect. And, and still really making nice. that money. Still, yeah. That's good. Um, oh, God. I also did the voiceover job. Did I tell you about that yet? The, yes. Uh, okay. I, I believe did. you did. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> for, for the sake of the podcast, I'm, adults, I would say. And adults. You did adults. Premiere. Adults had its premiere. Oh, my God. So quite a bit has happened for A lot you. has happened in the last month. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So by the next month, I want to actually do the reading in September. Uh-huh. Hopefully, that will be possible. Hopefully, I can get her. Um, yeah. I think that's what I want. What do you want to do by the... Well, that's... Um, see, for me, I'm trying to get... One of one of my biggest things is um, not being as financially stable, as well as most... One of the things that's been taking up my soul is um, my job right now. And it's... And I'm... I, last month, it was one of those things where it was a brand new job. And so... And it was a big job. And it was a job that took on a lot of responsibility that I've never wanted and or needed... But because I love this place so much, I wanted to give it my all. And I feel like I, I kind of put my neck out for people and I fought for people and I worked really hard. And the payoff just wasn't really there. I like the more I fought for people, the more they were unsatisfied with what I was doing and the more they would ask and the more they would want. And so I, I'm, I've, I am now at a point with this job where I'm just like, okay, it's a job. It is that a sucks. job. And it is what I do to pay my bills. And that is as far as it goes. I am focusing on finding a way to make my finances in a more creative field. Uh, even if it's just a couple um, a couple extra gigs here and there to, to really kind of focus on what it means to be on set. I really want to get an extra gig um, just to rake in a couple more ducats as well as to really be able to sit and watch what happens on a set that way i know i know a little bit better how i can conduct whatever set i am on when i finish this project as well as um get some more writing done on this not or uh, hopefully on this but if i get as stuck as i was um at least have myself write something. I've had I've written down six different ideas in the past two weeks and put none of them to paper. And so I'd like to at least attempt to see if any of them go sure. anywhere. Yeah. Um. Because a couple of them were written when I was drunk, and then a couple of them were just like, oh, I this is an idea that's come up again. So let me see what I can do with this. Let me see where I can go with this. So. A little ambitious, but at the end of the day, it's basically just finding a way to get to where you are and wanting to be more creative and wanting to actually, and finding a way to survive in this city while looking for more creative, more ways to be creative and find different creative outlets. In a lot of ways, New York is, like New York City is probably like the worst place to be when you're being an artist just because it's so expensive to live here and getting started in this field, it's so difficult to actually be pulling in any kind yeah. of mm-hmm wages it's it's unreal mm-hmm. i mean i'm still planning on keeping my job um yeah or yeah. find or finding or keeping my job and then finding potential work in my same field uh, in the in the bartending industry but um i'd also like to be a little bit more creative and maybe even even if it's on a scale that is um being an extra because that shit's fun and it's cool to kind of you get to eat for free get to eat for free I had a friend who read an entire book on set. That sounds cool to get paid to read. That might have been me. It was on a oh, that might have no. It was a. I read the entirety of The Shining on the set of Alpha House. Oh, see, I know. I was talking about. Um, I had an, <laughs> I had a friend who was on. She was on the set of some Disney TV show, and it was set in a high school cafeteria, and she was in the back reading. I think she read an entire Harry Potter book. So 
That sounds awesome I to mean, me. I mean, you know, it was the Philosopher's Stone, so it wasn't that impressive. Oh, no, I'm pretty sure it wasn't it was, Goblet of Fire. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Order of the Phoenix, which is by far the worst. <laughs> when I was younger, Order of the Phoenix was my favorite, and my least favorite was Deathly Hollows, or not Deathly Hollows, was uh, Half Blood Prince. Uh huh. That, like, swapped when I got older. Nice. See, my favorite is still Goblet of Fire. I think I liked Order of the Phoenix because of the big, like, fight at the end. Yeah, that was pretty and intense, so but, for, like... for me, that was, like, as a kid, that was like, oh, yeah! But, like, how many times did he need to go to detention? Jesus Christ! In the thousand pages, he went to detention for a good 700 of those. It was boring. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of feelings about... <laughs> Shots fired at J.K. Rowling. <laughs> Your career's over, man. Oh, I'm sure it is. I mean, here's... A, anyways, whatever. Um, and I think that's our show. <laughs> yeah, that's our show. Uh, so, yeah, join us for next month where we might have a guest again. I don't know. That was, that was an experiment. I'll have to listen back to everything and see... We've got a well, lot of material. <laughs> how well we handled that, yeah. That'll be interesting. Oh, thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> Do not uh, yawn. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs> thanks for listening, guys! <laughs> All right. Well, we'll talk to you next time. Have Bye. a super day.